Hello, and welcome to Unsheathed with your hosts, Kyle Gold and Cam Hirosaki. We hope that you enjoy the program. Please stick around afterwards. There'll be cake and blowjobs. Hi, and welcome to Unsheathed number 78. I am jazz record Kyle Gold. And I'm fast and slippery Cam Hirosaki. And we're joined, since we're doing our special lightning round today, we're joined by a timer woozle. Yep. Hi. <laughs> and uh, about all he's going to say is... Time. <laughs> there we go. Or shut the heck up. <laughs> I will not say heck. <laughs> uh, you were over eight seconds ago. Shut the hell up. <laughs> um, you were hella over. <laughs> it's a hell of a high national priority banquet. What? That's from some Sarah Palin tweet. Oh, uh, okay. At, at Sarah Palin USA. Yeah, don't don't give her more publicity. I mean, I guess none of Are you being paid by her? Users is no, nobody who listens to this show wants to be preached to by Sarah Palin. Yeah, right. Um, well, so the first order of business is to uh, complete the rectification of the loss of the original episode seventy seven, which was live at WonderCon. Yes. So we are going to take you back to two weeks ago. Yeah. Actually, 15 days ago, yeah. technically, and recreate the last remaining lost scene from WonderCon. Kit, can we have some Scooby-Doo flashback noises in here? Awesome, thanks. <laughs> um, if you're listening to this and are just greeted with a few seconds of silence, you can thank Kit Silver for not putting the sound effects in. <laughs> But if you did put them in, great job. Your your dollars at work. So it was a few weeks ago that we went to FWA, and uh, one of the things that we did while there was this actually started back at Furry Fiesta when Siani got a badge for his baller name, which was Red, which Ink. Was Red Ink. And uh, B Hop was also at Furry Fiesta, and he thought that was a great idea. And we thought that was a great idea too. So we got in touch with. Uh, Mitty, who used to go by Touch My Badger, and I think that's still her FA account. Um, I think that's her commissions account now. Right. And I said I wanted to do a baller name badge for me as KG2, and which basically was me being terrible at basketball because I'm a writer. And it is. And, it is. But it is an amazing badge about terribleness. And, uh, and then when Kit saw that at FWA, uh, she wasn't real busy, so he had commissioned one of K-Tech as a robot wolf playing basketball, which was awesome. And then we thought that since we had three people on the podcast, we needed a third baller badge, so we got this for you. For me? You yes. shouldn't have. <laughs> Wait a minute, Kyle. This is the wrong species. <laughs> <laughs> you did not notice that right away. No, I didn't, which is funny. And it's not and it's not the wrong species, it's just the wrong activity. Yes. For those of y'all who can't see this, which is none of us, uh <laughs> it's it's got me with this, you know, shellfish on my belly as I'm floating on my back trying to smash it open with a basketball and it's adorable it is like super cute I've got this really determined look on my face but and, you did, and, and, and he did kind of squeal when we first presented it to him it was eee! There. <laughs> yes it was very Something much like, like that, that. Um, so our, our explanation it was it was too funny of, of a physical humor gag not to do but None of us really realized it till she was about halfway through, and then she was like, "Wait, is he? A, he's a river otter." You said, and we're like, "Yeah." They don't, and she's like, "They don't do that." And we're like, "Oh," I'm like, "Okay, well, they don't play basketball either, so, <laughs> so who cares?" And she's I like, like all "No, no, of it's us funny." Had the same but, delayed reaction to wait a minute. That's not a river because, otter because it is an otter kind of thing. Yeah. So our explanation for it was that um, K Fish had seen sea otters doing it and when he got himself in possession of a shellfish yeah he wanted to grab his basketball and yeah you're doing it wrong so but it's still super cute and as i've said in the past um if y'all have baller names and want a baller name badge you should go check out touch my badger and tell her you want a baller name badge because she's apparently very taken with them she enjoys them a lot and i hope b-hop's gotten her a baller name i haven't actually seen whether he has or not 
You know, actually, I just realized, I bet if you had a basketball, you could easily kill crayfish with it. Oh, yeah. Good solid dribble, bam, smash it right open. Oh, you of course, then kill be probably a lot eat. of things. Mostly arthropods. Yeah, spiders. Annelids. Uh-huh. Probably not nematodes. Or platyhelminthes. Yeah, they're pretty durable. You can you take a putty hel- you can take friends. a putty helminthes, split its head in half, and it will just split into two separate organisms. Yeah, that's freaky. They are they are kind of freaky. Yeah, um, they look cute though, on, like, with the big giant eye spots. Yes, they were actually um, <laughs> they were used in uh, weasel Alan, does not approve. They were used in Alan Moore's uh, Saga of the Swamp Thing. Really? Yeah, the when uh, Alex is uh, dreaming. When he's all like becoming the swamp thing, he's dreaming about flatworms, and um, they, what do they do in his dream? They set up a terrible pun. They do something like, "Well, hey, you're welcome here, but you're not Jewish, are you?" And he's like, "What? No, I'm not Jewish." And they're like, "Good, because we're all plain Aryan worms here." <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh, why? But they were flatworms. I think. Uh, I think we might have the book kicking around. Oh, no, it's in one of our boxes. Anyway. That's a long way to go and a lot of science to pull out for that bad of a pun. Yeah, but it's a great book. No, yeah. Alan Moore's Swamp Thing Run is terrific. Yes, it is. Anyway, back to the present day. Thanks, Kit. (laughs) (laughs) I was coming back from the Scooby-Doo flashback. You could, um, you could like, oh, uh, it's probably copyrighted to use the sound of the DeLorean flashing in. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's all just kind of like electric <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, anyway, um, today is the last day for Ursa Major voting. So by the time you listen to this, it will be too late. But Shame thank you for you voting vote. because I'm sure all of our <laughs> listeners did, despite what Cam thinks of you. I believe in you. Um. What do we? What else do we have coming up? Um, uh, stuff we can't talk about yet. Uh, a couple things. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're gonna have some guests on the show coming up. We've got a couple of fur suit people coming to talk about creating characters and stories to go with your costumes, uh, which is cool. And something that I've been thinking about recently is sort of the mainstream perception of furry is. People who like to dress up in costumes but don't understand, but the mainstream doesn't understand why. And I think it's, I think they, they, they're starting like one step too far. Like they don't understand that the fandom is about the enjoyment of these anthropomorphic animal characters and the costumes is just one expression of that. They just jump right to, hey, it's people who love to dress up in costumes and they think that everything else comes from that. Yeah. And they sort of have it like they have it backwards because they've jumped onto the wrong side of the mirror. Right. Or something. Wow, my analogy just went somewhere and I couldn't follow it. Yeah. Like the leaps of logic these people are making. Yes. Um All so right, saved it. Those are gonna be so those are good that they'll be on the show. Um we are going to do an editing challenge again in a couple of weeks. We have some stuff that people sent in, like apparently over half a year ago. Yeah, and like one um, one pregnancy cycle ago. <laughs> really? That's where your mind goes. We never talk about pregnancy on this show, especially not impreg. No, it was one of the three things we're not allowed. Right next to Vor and LeBron. <laughs> um, but anyway. We're going to get back to answering questions and talking about um, writing and um, hopefully I have some more guests on, which uh, we will talk about in the course of going through the lightning round. So, do you have anything else to add, Cam? I think we're both working on the same things we were working yeah, on a week ago. I Nothing real so. exciting has happened since then. My life is not very exciting. All right. As so we discussed when we had Blender Then on. we're going to make it more exciting by going to a lightning round. Yes. That'll get my energy levels up. Uh, I'm oh, yeah. About to. <laughs> Thank you, Kit. This is where if this were a Japanese show, you'd have some cute little mascot pop up and explain what's going on. Can you do it in your uh, no. weasel voice? Not, no, not with him within arm's reach. He can throttle me and there's glass in the room. Um, 
So how about I'll, I will I will explain and you will do it in the Japanese voice as I'm after I I say it. Oh, would that be too crazy? I am very bad at simultaneous translation. Okay, no, that, is, that is a skill I have not developed. <laughs> All right, <laughs> lightning round is 21 questions in 42 minutes. We have two minutes per question. We may go under the time allotted, but not over the time allotted. Reading of the question counts as part of the two minutes. And some of the messages have been redacted for length in ways that will not affect the content. Just give us more time to answer them. KM and I will alternate questions. I will begin, and the uh, timer woozle will tell us, will signal us when we have a short amount of time left, and we will wrap it up. And then when he says time, we have to start reading the next question. Hi, Matakusono Tori desu. Excellent. Are we ready to go? Alrighty. I always feel like I always feel like we're about to start like the final round of the ten thousand dollar pyramid when we do this. Like, here's your first question. Boop. Go. <laughs> Boop. Greetings, sheathers, and any guests. Editing my book has been consuming me in my winter break, so I hardly have had a chance to listen to the podcast. Now that I'm all caught up, I thought I'd write in again. Recently, I've joined a site called FurRag.com. On paper, it is a fantastic place for aspiring furry writers to get critique and advice on their works. In practice, it is much less so, however. The site is very underused, and as a result, both the story and forum sections don't get much in the way of web traffic. I'm writing in to spread the word about this wonderful site and hopefully drum up a few new members. If you are a furry writer and you either seek to improve or wish to mentor others, or if you just want to have your stories looked at, join up. Again, the address is www.furrag.com. That's about it. I'll pest you with questions at a later date. Best wishes, Al Floor. Al Floor was one of the first who came to the New York meet. He's a very nice gentleman. Okay. We enjoyed meeting him. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I used to use Furrag a lot when it first came out, which was like back in the mid-aughts. And uh, yeah, it, it doesn't really get a lot of traffic, which is unfortunate. Yeah, we're aware of it. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of places on the web that are good for critique but do not get a lot of traffic. Uh, critique Circle is another one. Uh, there's a group on FA called I Love Critique, yeah. which I think is more for art. But um, there's also uh, a website uh, deceptively named critters.com, I think it is, or critters.org, huh. which is, is short for critiquers. But I always look at it and think of the old anthology comic. Um I was thinking, like, hey, we're critters. <laughs> yeah, we're critters. Exactly. I'm an otter. Critters was one of the very first anthology comics. I don't know if you remember them. I have heard of it. It was, uh, it was like, went 50 issues. Um, so, yeah, if uh, if you want to go and, and join up with Fur Rag, uh, it's a good place to go. Otherwise, if you have a lot of followers on FA, I have found that posting just journals or other entries saying, hey, critique my stuff, people tend to respond to that. Yep. So, there you go. Hello again. I've enjoyed your first show of 2011 more than usual, and I believe there is one simple explanation for it. Kit was an active member of the discussion. I understand that Kit isn't an author like Kyle or KM, aw, but he's still a part of the show, and it would be great to see more participation from him in the upcoming year. You asked for suggestions for the show, and that's my first one. Now that my, we're a third of the way into the year. My second suggestion is to have other authors on the show as well, not just ones that live near you, but perhaps even some who live on the other side of the country, or maybe even in another country. It would be nice to see Canter or one of your other frequent writers pop onto the show rather than just right into it. You've done long-distance shows before between the two of you, so I'm quite sure it'd be possible to do a show involving someone else as well. But most of all, please continue to entertain the masses. Thanks for the entertaining 2010, Jay Hopkins, a.k.a. Psy Cheetah. I should note that I'm not critiquing him for writing when we're a third of the way into the year. I'm critiquing us for only getting to the yeah. question now that we're a third of the way into the year, which is part of the reason we're doing the lightning round in the first place. Another rule of lightning round is that we talk real fast and try to make each other laugh during it, but... That's kind of a rule for most of our podcasts. Um, so we actually have um, – this is a, a, not an official announcement yet because we haven't set a date or nothing. But um, Catherine Valenti, who wrote Palimpsest and Habitation of the Blessed, Orphan's Tales, uh, Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making. Yeah. Um, and uh, another book called Deathless, which just came out. Fairyland is coming out in paperback form in about two weeks. Um she has tentatively consented to come onto our show when she visits the Bay Area and uh, chat with us about her books and who knows what else. Maybe furry animals and maybe not. Yeah. Maybe whatever. I am looking forward to meeting her regardless. Yes, I am too. I think it'll be awesome. And we are going to try to get other authors on the show as well. Yeah. 
the technology isn't the issue so much as it is like the scheduling and the planning. Right. Because when somebody lives in another country, you have to budget for when you're available to do it. And that's harder than you might think at a glance. Dear Unsheathed, I had a question about Deus Ex Machina. In recent stories, especially in their endings, I fear that I sometimes use deus ex machina too much, which is to say, to borrow from Wikipedia, I insert a plot device whereby a previously intractable problem is suddenly and abruptly solved with a contrived introduction of a new character, ability, or object. How does one avoid deus ex machina? On a similar topic, when writing, how convenient is too convenient? For instance, if the, happens, the happenstance of main characters meeting through serendipitous occurrences. Thanks for your time, Geo. Um, and also we want to thank Gio for his comments about the FC show, which we did not read on the air since he said we didn't have to. Okay. Um, but they were very nice comments and we appreciated them. So yeah, the big thing here is this is where redrafting your stories really comes in handy because you're able to, uh, you know, establish something earlier on and, you know, you can foreshadow things. I mean, that's, that's basically what it comes down to is, you know, if it comes out, literally out of nowhere like this thing that comes in to wrap things up it just sort of feels cheap yeah like oh something we've never heard of suddenly comes and saves the day um i think as as kind of a rule of thumb you get one outrageous coincidence per book or per story um people will uh, it is a work of fiction and you can kind of juggle things around as long as the complete plot doesn't hinge on your one occurrence right and also the earlier it comes in the book the more lax you you, the more you're allowed to have it like you can have the main characters meet through serendipity and that kicks off the plot right um but to have the whole plot resolved through uh circumstance or chance or whatever um does not work well to bring this back to star wars again like i always do look at the end of you know episode four a new hope when you know han solo comes back to sort of you know get Darth Vader off of Luke's tail. If it, some random person you'd never heard of should okay. do that, that would be cheap. Who had three letters in the pool? Time. <laughs> Good day in <laughs> land and water foxes. As I edit my novel, I got to wondering how you two got, go about editing your novels. Do you have a defined process, or does it vary from piece to piece? I don't know if you've ever talked about the steps you take while doing it, and I am curious. And if you have already discussed it, could you point me to the podcast where you did? No. Fluffy, fluff, I think Cluffy is making an index of all our podcasts. I highly enjoy listening to your live show and continue to find inspiration from your podcast. Keep up the good work. Lastly, KM, plus 100 spider points to you for knowing the lyrics to rock sets the look. They are my favorite band, and you made my day. Roxette was my favorite band back in high school, by the way, voice. so kudos to you. I even had their Spanish album, Baladas en Español. Many thanks, voice the spider Wolf. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't think Kid approves of spider points, so you may have to sort of keep those separate from the podcast. Um, you know, uh, editing is... I think, we've, I think we've talked about... I know we've, we've spent an episode talking yeah. about the steps we take while editing, but just that's why we, we're kind of doing this brief. Um, editing, I try to read over what I what I have without yeah. making changes, get a sense for the story as a whole, and make mental notes of the points where the story needs work to fit back into yeah. my vision of it. Uh, things that, as you were talking about in the last question, need to be foreshadowed, things which need to be structured, and, you know, think places where the pacing's off. Yeah, it's like, step one, figure out what the fuck story did I just write? <laughs> Now it's okay. How do I actually make this a smooth and coherent story and not so? Because, you know, in your first draft, you're going to be making some stuff as you go along. Some people don't. Some people literally do hammer out every piece ahead of time and then write it. I think that's pretty rare. Yeah. And then second draft is usually to get this, you know, when I'm editing second draft, it's to get the story in place. Third and fourth draft is for kind of pacing and polishing and description and stuff. Yeah, and I do various degrees of rewriting. Like with Summerhill, I basically threw out an entire draft and was like, okay, now that I know what I want to have happen, I'm just going to do it all over again because that way it will actually fit what's in my mind now. Hey, Triple K Cast, just writing in with a quick question and an update. I'm clocking 43,000 words on the novel right now, and I've still got a whole lot of story to tell. I take that as a good sign. Now my question, more of an issue rather, I have an issue with dialogue. Not so much in some scenes as others, I have the most trouble with intimate dialogue, such as in a scene I wrote recently in which two of my characters had a discussion about the nature of their relationship. I reread it after I wrote it, and the conversation seems static, flat, and kind of awkward when it's supposed to be serious and have an effect on what happens in the future of the story. Is this lack of realism in the words an oversight on my part? Do I really know the characters when I think I do, or is there something else I'm missing? Thanks for your continued advice, guys. I'm sure I'm not the only one who really appreciates it. Your faithful listener, Shane. 
I don't think your problem is lack of realism here. I think your problem is over realism. Uh, conversations about the nature of your relationship are really weird and awkward and don't necessarily flow naturally. Um, yeah. So my, my advice sort of thinking about this is every scene in your book should start with both characters in the scene or all the characters in the scene wanting something and every line of dialogue should reflect what they want in that scene and how they're going about getting it. Yeah. Um, when you write dialogue as like in first drafts, the conversations tend to go round and round and what you need to do is kind of do mini edits on them and pick out the salient points. Yeah. What is then, the point of this conversation? And then if you've come to a point where you're like, Oh, it would, the character should say something more striking, but oh, I don't know about that. Always punch it up. Make it yeah. more, make it more, 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 because you're writing. Kill as much small talk as you can. Right. What's the the Hollywood script rule? Is like how many? How how much can yeah. you trim off the beginning and end of every scene and still have it make sense? Yeah. And so, that's that's not bad for any kind and, of dialogue. Writing. And streamline it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Short and sweet, simple, direct, and to the point. How many minutes? How many words per minute do each of you type from Trendane? You took the test. Dude. Yeah, I don't even remember. I, well, it's not even really relevant because the number of words per minute I type really isn't how much I, many words per minute I write. Yeah, there, uh, that is completely and, different. <laughs> but I, I, and I was going to say, you know, it's not the number of words you type; it's the quality of the words you type. Yeah, but I think when I did it, I was in the mid 80s yeah I was, you were in the low 90s uh, yeah i think i was like i think i had like 92 yeah i think i was like 81 and I or something hit like two mistakes or something in those yeah. 90 something but yeah uh insert salutation here granted i have about Mark! 26 episodes left to <laughs> listen to but so far i've not heard anything about how to self-publish i have a novel that i'm almost done with nine chapters left to write thirty-six thousand words so far and i would like to make a small batch of printed copies say a dozen at the high end that i want to give away to friends do I take my gay dog smut to Kinko's and say, here, have at it, spiral bound, please, or what? A conscientious obscurist, Drew. I would first off say you would not take it to Kinko's because they're all FedEx office now. Yes. Although, they, the <laughs> point thereof, uh, actually, uh, I have getting a novel manuscript spiral bound at Kinko's and or FedEx office will cost you around the ballpark of about $30. Well, depending on the novel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I should also say that I've got... That's for one copy, by the way. That um, in the last couple of weeks, I was checking the Unsheathed FA account. Or, I'm sorry. I was checking today, and sometime in the last couple of weeks, he sent us a follow-up note on the FA account saying he's already gone and got him bound, but oh, wow. just for future. Okay. So I guess he did go to Kinko's, but um, yeah, go to Kinko's. Yeah. Print it out. They'll bind it. They have seen much, much worse than your gay dog smut, I assure you. Yeah, and they don't look at the file, or they don't look at the words. You give it to them, and they print it. I right. Mean, it's Even if you have a like, gay dog smut image on the cover, um, really? you will be more embarrassed than they will be. Yeah, I know. Uh, somebody they went might and, print out an extra copy and keep it for I themselves. I remember a, a well-known local furry artist at one point had to get prints for a convention at short notice and had to just go to like a Kinko's and like, yep. hey, can you run me off coffee to these? And they're like, look like, okay, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> so it, it's not against any sort of policy. So there you go. All right. Hello, Unsheathed Crew. A question I've asked before and still wonder today, but what are your opinions on the ability for free literature to branch out as far as genres go? The obvious gay romance has its appeal in reader base, but what if fantasy, sci-fi, horror, thriller, suspense, or even just general fiction where it is in today's world, but with furries not allowing for anything real without romance? As you might have gleaned from my previous emails on this one, I am not a romance writer. I'm not against it, but I do not like to write a sex scene as it comes out wrong, so I keep more of clean works. Others have said that there is a possibility of an untapped well, since works like Redwall and the Warriors and such can exist to be popular. But what are your opinions? Is there a market for other genres, or even simply a reader bait that might be untapped? Do you think a furry story might sell well if it were horror or sci-fi, but no romance? Do these genres exist in furry literature but are obscure? Your insight is welcome. Your friendly East Coast Bobcat Border Walker. Um, first off, I would say check out the Sofa Wolf and Fur Planet catalog because I can rattle off a, probably two or three books in each one of those categories you mentioned already and yeah. out, out and in print. Um, just off the top of my head, non-romance books, um, uh, Kevin Frayne's uh, Thousand Leaves and Seventh Chakra, um, Save the Day. Um, it's, is it romance? It's 
No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's not, more it's, it's more not. superhero adventure. Um, Phil Goy is resisting yeah, arrest. Resisting arrest is like a um, sci-fi thing. And uh, Christina Tracer's book, uh, I don't believe, is a romance. Um, that's science fiction. Smiley and the Hero. Smiley is and the a, Hero is an adventure and is Ryan not a romance. Campbell. Found One um, Apocalypse. Found One Apocalypse is sci-fi. Um, so yeah, yeah, they're all out there, and we're not even tapping the well here. Yeah, those are uh, those are just the ones I know off the top of my head. Yeah, so. and I went on a huge rant about furry not being a genre and how it's a meta genre and a mode to do, and within that, any genre is valid. Also, don't confuse writing sex scenes with being a romance author; they're not one and the same. Right, and I would just say there's a lot of romance because I can't stop writing books. <laughs> um, Hello to Mr. Fox and Mr. Otter. My question for you both is, do you base your stories upon past life experiences or life experiences of a friend? That's not an either or. Uh, I'm wondering because whenever I write my own lyrics, I find much inspiration from recent events, such as being bullied or finding a new partner. Uh, sorry about the first. Congrats on the second. Also, I was listening to the New Year's podcast where Kyle announced that Kit and himself have gotten married. I wish you both a very happy future together. Love from Eolf and the rest of the UK furs. P.S. I may have a little crush on K.M. Hirosaki. Aw. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Um, I got a British person with a crush on me. You know... Um, You're jealous, aren't you, foosball? We base, we oh, base stories <laughs> on... Um, we base stories on all kinds of things. Yeah. Sorry, you go. And sometimes, like in the case of Summerhill, I make something up, and even I don't know where it comes from. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean, it's a little mix of our life experiences. Uh, oh. I've talked before about listening to advice column podcasts and reading advice columns and just uh, things that happen to real people. And... When you've seen and heard enough of that, then you start find you start imagining things that might happen to real people, and then later you read about things like them which did happen to real people, and then you're yeah. like, "Oh wow, okay, um, that's happened to me a couple times now." Yeah, I actually had somebody ask me the other day about you know, oh, like I'm f like the more I write about my persona, the weirder I like find it to write about. It's like this is getting harder to do, and I was like, I think that's because as you get more experience with writing you're going to eventually develop sort of this you know natural instinct to want to write about actual fictional things and not just borrow from reality quite so much yeah i find i find too the uh, people seem to kind of gravitate towards a, a realistic fiction thing like you can start with wild outrageous stuff and then it, it gradually kind of the all the wildness gets taken out in the beginning or you start with light humor and it becomes mm. more serious and so on yes okay hey there guys it's ron and Callan. and first of all i just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to consistently do this wonderful writing podcast now as for my question as writers we constantly have ideas floating around in our heads at any given moment we get inspired and have another idea instantly springs into our minds like kyle was just talking about <laughs> do either of you guys think it's better to let those ideas mature and percolate in your minds do you have coherent settings and narratives fleshed out around them or do you think it's better to immediately write those ideas down so you at least have them documented also a special note my first email to unsheed looking forward to hearing your answer is ronnie Callan. Um, the answer is yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, keep a writing notebook and just jot down the core of the idea. You don't have to start writing the story right away. But um, it's if you have an idea, a good idea for a story, you know, keep a notebook where you can keep track of those things. And then later on, when you're looking for something to write, you can go back to it and figure it out. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have so many ideas that I just don't really have time to write them all down, even if I wanted to. I have a notebook where I sort of keep ideas that have been on the back burner, but I mean, that I have notebooks, like that idea notebook goes back several years, and there are some in the very beginning that I haven't touched. Yeah, and what I kind of do is I have like, I'll have story files, and I'll just put the thing into the story file, and then I'll save it, mm -hmm. and sometimes it'll float around and come back, and sometimes it won't, and... You know, if I'm looking for something to write, I could just do that. For anyone who has listened to the chapter one reading of Summerhill that I just did, and Unsheath presents number seven, uh, that's one of those stories where I think if I had tried to let it percolate too long before writing it, it would have come out even worse than it did the first three times I tried to write it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that's. Are we good? Yeah, All right. we're good. Dear K named podcasters, when it comes to referring to anthros, what words do you prefer when you're referring to a group, especially a group comprised of different species, persons, or people? The only word that has actually that has satisfied me is actually used in Basecraft Cirrostratus, um, written by friend of the podcast, Three Tales, Yep. Uh, as creatures. 
How do you feel about the use of man or woman versus male-female? The latter is used today. Police reports, for instance, but just completely substituting male-female for man-woman comes off as odd. For instance, the phrase dirty old man just sounds odd as dirty old male. Also, what do you do about animal-specific phrases? In isolation play, I spotted bear hug and gym rat pop up, for instance, but these seem to not make sense in the context of an anthro world where a bear hug would not be unique among bears, especially in the context of isolation play where species equals ethnicity. Wouldn't gym rat be an ethnic slur? slur? Rashawn. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't species not equal ethnicity in isolation play in that world? No, not specifically, but yeah. it's kind of it's kind of a different layer of culture. Yeah. Like, you can be Jewish and from Israel, or you can be Jewish and from New York. Yeah. I mean, you could be a tiger and from Russia, or you could be a tiger and from India, or yeah. you could be a tiger and American. Um, so... Yeah, I tried to I tried to think about those expressions as best I could. Um, Jim Rat probably slipped through. Yeah. Um, bear hug I still think makes sense because yeah. bears are big and yeah, yeah, you are hugging like a bear. That's yeah. still completely like scans over. But yeah, like I have no problem using the phrase "dirty old man," like referring to somebody as a dirty old man in a furry context. And yeah, I tried. I had a big thing with isolation play where I was trying to avoid, you know, I was trying to avoid using man and woman. So when it says "be a man." I was trying to find an equivalent to that, and yeah. I never came up with a real good one. But I don't like – I personally don't like man and woman in a furry world, um, and I usually use people rather than creatures. Yeah, because Pe- they're still people. They're animal people. They are Dudes people. and dudes. Times. Dear purveyors of finest smut, your podcast is one of my favorites. I always look forward to the next episode. I have my suspicions about who wrote which you're starting your writing challenges, but I think I need another listen before I fit fingers. I wrote one, he wrote the other. Another old email. KM, I'm looking especially forward to Summer Hill being ready one of these days. It will be, I swear. Ever since your brief description of time and space spanning plot, my ears have been perked up in anticipation. There just isn't enough good furry sci-fi for my appetite. His ears must be tired. I'm just like, hey, <laughs> could you guys please expand on your comments in episode <laughs> 70 about how one should aim for a story-driven narrative? not a character driven narrative I just need a little clarification on what you meant by that also how important when you say this rule is effective to stories is to effective storytelling thanks guys your dedicated Australian listener and knob practitioner Jinto ooh Kendall a challenger <laughs> appears yes um, I don't know that I would ever yeah. have said aim for a story driven rather than character driven no. because all my I think stories we just are character driven yeah. I think we just said that they're different right so basically uh, character driven follows the journey of a character. Uh, they are missing something in their life, whether they know it or not. And the story tells how they either get that thing or don't get that thing or realize they don't need that thing or don't realize that they don't need it or yeah. something. Um, story driven would be uh, this series of things happens and it's more like an action movie if you think about yeah. it or a heist movie. And it's not, this isn't black and white. Like, if you look at Star Wars, there is a character story for Luke Skywalker, but there is also a plot-driven series of events involving the battle with the Rebellion against the Empire. Right, and the problem with the prequels is that there's... There's all neither. Story, well, <laughs> they're all, they're all story-driven, but the story's not very good, and there's no character no. arcs. I mean, the first one ostensibly has a story, like the... They're sent to this ship to do this thing, and they get attacked, and they have to go to this planet. And, and at no point in the story do they explain what is driving any of it. No, it's all just kind of one thing leads to another. Palpatine's behind it all. <laughs> Dear Sheathers, I've recently been contacted by a voice actors interested in making a recording of one of my stories. Giddy with glee, I started flipping back through what I'd written and realized that I had nothing really suited to audio. Most of them are too long, the flow of them isn't as compelling when read aloud, and the narrative voices aren't strong enough. Man, no worries. I thought I'll just write a new one for him. Then it struck me that I'm really not quite sure how to do so. I've done the best I can, but I'm not even really sure what to look for. How would you both change the way you write when intending to write specifically for a voice actor or audiobook? Candrel, the turncoat of tongue play. Ha <laughs> ha! Blowjobs! I love Responding it. Responding to the challenge. Yes. Um, I'm going to say that I don't quite agree with the assertion that he's making that a story is inherently poorly suited to being read out loud yeah yeah that was kind of my thought too and it's just like how would i write specifically for something to be read out loud i'm like i wouldn't yeah i mean if you're saying like oh the narrative voice isn't strong enough i think that that's a problem with the story and (laughs) not that it's just not suited to be read aloud yeah i was gonna say if your if your story doesn't sound good when read aloud then you should do another that (laughs) yeah do another (laughs) editing pass on it Uh, because one of the things that we keep saying to you people as you are editing your story is read it aloud yeah, and, yeah, I mean, 
honestly, go over your stuff again. I'm sure you can find something that would be good. You know, even if it's like, you know, from the quick little sex stories to the not as quick things, like go back and listen to our own Unsheathed Presents. We so have a if, whole bunch of different stories. So if I were read. if I were writing a story specifically for audio, depending on how well I liked the person who was going to voice it, I would try to make it as embarrassing as possible to be read aloud. So that's my hint for you. Wow, Kendall. you have I, I bet you have no experience with that <laughs> at all. Yeah, unfortunately, the only person I've done that for is myself. Um, no, uh, hi. Man of Squeal, come on. Yeah, but I had to read most of that. And I had to read the embarrassing slutty parts, so there you go. <laughs> okay, well, read a letter. <laughs> Hello, River Swimmer, Prairie Hopper, <laughs> and also in Sometimes Forgotten Technical Wolf. He is a robot. He plays basketball. I want Winning to start off by saying you. thank you for a great Losing show, and that I'm you. always learning very much every time I listen. Sorry. I have a question. I did not want to wait nuggets. till rain for us to do it to bug me for some time now. As you know, or perhaps not, I've been writing several short stories that are series that have begun to wonder, perhaps, if I am breaking a rule that I do not understand. The two of you have mentioned many times in the show you must know the rules before you can break them. So here is my dilemma. I am unsure of to which rule I am breaking. I am following one particular character for some time throughout the story, then I switch character, but I do it in such a way that I repeat part of the previous character's speech or motions, but this time I do it from the point of view of the new character. This is a constant theme I do throughout most of the stories. So now that you know what I am doing, what rule am I breaking? Perhaps what style of writing am I doing? Is there even a name for what type of story I am writing? Is there anyone uh, else who might be writing in this style? I hope this is not an overloaded bit of questioning. I just want to make these stories slash cases I am writing even stronger by knowing the rules. Ever listening and reading, uh, ever listener and reader of your story is running cat. Um, Stephen King and Peter Straub's The Talisman. Yeah. Just points of view like that. A uh, couple, yeah. couple different books do that. I don't honestly yeah. think you're breaking any rules. No, I, I was gonna say it is a device I have seen before, and yeah. that's what it is. This isn't a rule. It's 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 a narrative device, and I mean it's not super super common, but it's common enough that I've certainly seen it in a lot of things. Where I, know, I've switched between characters in a couple of my recent books, but I don't do the overlap thing. No, but a lot of and like a lot of times, if you do the overlap, it'll be like the last line of dialogue will repeat right. itself. It'll be like a really short like snippet that'll do so. So yeah, I don't know what it's called except multiple point of view, uh, multiple protagonists. Yeah. I don't. Know. I mean, yeah, I don't think there's a t- specific term for it. Yeah, but no, you're absolutely allowed to do that. Yep. yep. I like the discussion, uh, no greeting. I like the discussion about whether stories in the furry meta genre can break through into the mainstream. I think you mentioned that. I think you, we did. I think you missed an important furry movie, Planet of the Apes, which I just learned today they're making another one of with James Franco. And, um, and I uh, saw a trailer for it in front of Scream 4. Andy Serkis, right, because almost human CG, right? Uh, the apes are ape-like despite their human attributes, and the humans are, well, decidedly non-human, but I still rank it as one of the furriest movies to ever have been produced, whether it was intentionally made that way or not. And it was a huge, massive cultural event. It paved the way for things like Star Wars to happen in terms of toy sales and promotion, and it's still one of the best, most well-known movies ever made, if only for the damn dirty ape line and the final shot. Spoiler. Not to mention the sequels... <laughs> <laughs> Most of which are terrible but interesting. It's po- it's an old movie. It's yeah. possible that some of our listeners, you know, who were not it born is, it, when it Star is, Wars it is came a out, might moment. not have seen it. What's well, Planet of the Apes? Um, not to mention the sequels, most of which are terrible but interesting. I remember the one where the world blows up. Anyway, it was a good discussion, and I agree that people are furry should simply focus on making the best product they can, regardless of whether they find mainstream success or not. It's very good advice that I will no doubt ignore because of my self-destructive writing habits. Why would you not make the best thing you can? Uh, anyway, which would also be a good theme for a podcast if you haven't done it yet. I've only listened to the last four or five, so latest four or five so far. I also want to mention the Sholan Alliance series, which are one of my favorite series of books ever written. Lizanne Norman was the guest of honor at Anthrocon one year, 2005-ish. Anyway, it's great sci-fi and definitely more of the aliens that happen to look like feline style um, from Danath. Danath, I believe is a tiger. Danath is a tiger, and he was one of the people who founded the Erotic Furry Writing Group back in aught for yeah. whenever that was going on when they had the writing challenges and we were doing little stories every week for I it. I think I remember him from Yifnet IRC back when that was a thing. Wow. So, anyway. Uh, you've letter, but not much Alliance to say on the about. podcast, haven't you? Did, uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with them. Some, it wasn't me, but I know Sean Alliance has come up on the podcast. Okay. Oh, maybe it was the one about... Fuck. Time. 
<laughs> Greetings, K and K. I'll let you decide which is which. I call K. It's been a while since my last oh. email. I've recently done a concept for a story, and I wanted to know if you've ever heard of something similar being done before. Basically, I want to write not one novel, but a group of novels. <gasps> Each would be a self-sufficient, fully complete story of a no. different person who nonetheless are all drawn together for a common event. Each would have their own drives, their own motives, their own reasons for joining the fight. Occasionally, they'd work together. Or occasionally, they'd oppose each other. But for the most part, they'd work apart from each other. Their actions indirectly affect any other groups. Like Saga Frontier for the PlayStation 1. The idea is that while a single story story could be read and understood as well as any other story, an interesting reader could read the other stories as well and, through a different view of the events, gain more of an understanding for why things happened the way they did. An example, and probably a good choice of how it's been done before, as it has, is covering a story of the same war from the different sides involved. Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima. There you go. Anyway, if you've heard of any good examples of this being done before... See above. I could use for inspiration or any comments or advice. I'd look forward to hearing it. And thanks for taking the time to read this email. Sincerely, Earth Digger. Uh, there were a couple of like eight, 18th century, 17, uh, 18th, 19th century French writers. Uh, Balzac did the human comedy, which was like 20 novels um, about a town, and each one focused on a different character from that town. Um, Emile Zola had a bunch of books that were kind of linked together like that in the same world, and they would sort of um, mesh with people. Um, both kind of depressing, as I recall. Um, Flags of Our Fathers and Sands from Iwo Jima, or Letters from Iwo Jima, talks about the Battle of Iwo Jima from the American side and then the Japanese side. There's also the Lion King one and a half, which talks about the events of the original Lion King from the points of view of Timon and Pumbaa. You know, I have not seen that, weirdly enough. Outside of the U.S., furry. it was just billed as the Lion King 3, which doesn't make any fucking sense. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Do you have any other examples? Anything from Star Wars? <sighs> Is there like a Star Wars? Yes, movie? time there is. Fuck. <laughs> I, Jedi by Michael Stackpole, retells the events of the Jedi Academy. I said time. Kevin Anderson. Told from the point of view of Corn. Uh, dear Fluffy Tail, uh, this is going to be a long one, so I have to read fast. Dear Fluffy Tailed and Webby Fingered podcasters, as well as any somethingy something guests, during a discussion with a friend of mine regarding a sex scene Bitch in one weasel. of my stories, it got me to wondering if there is any sort of optimal placement for such a scene. <laughs> Using the example that inspired this letter, there were a couple places in my story where a sex scene could theoretically go. One good spot was near the end, but while it provides some resolution to earlier tension, it might come across as tacked on. But my concern about putting it a little earlier was that while it helped develop the characters, it didn't really advance the plot in and of itself, and there might be some readers who would see the end of the sex scene as effectively the end of the story, grab a tissue, and move on to something else. Oh, was it sad? Am I overthinking this? If a reader's going to skip the rest of the story because the sexy bit is over, is that more their problem than mine? Yes. Or is it a failure of mine in making the rest of the story uninteresting? Although now that I type that out, it could be a combination of both. But either way, are there any thoughts from you guys on when an erotic story should I'm blow its wad? Are some spots inherently better than others, or should it be entirely based on the flow of the story? Always eager to learn at the pause of the masters, Mythic Fox. Yeah, um, really, it, it, if you're writing a story specifically to include an erotic scene, build up to it naturally and tell the story that needs to be told from that. Yeah, I would say within the flow of the story. There there are readers who are going to control F, cock it anyway, so, yeah. I mean, if, the, if that's all they're looking to read, then that's all they're going to read, and you know what? They do it to your story as quick as they do it to anyone else's without reading what comes around it. So, you know, just try to write the story as naturally as you can, and don't try to, like, don't try to trick people into yeah. reading it, because the people who are just going to read it for the sex are just going to read it for the sex. They, and the people who want to read the story it. are going to read the story regardless of how <laughs> you also, structure it. I've also started stories with sex scenes. I have, too. Yeah. Or multiple times, as I like to say, in Medias Blowjob. Yep. All right. Hello, fantastic Mr. Fox and whimsical Mr. Otter. I'm an avid listener of your wonderful podcast, and I thought I've asked writing-related questions to both of you before. I'd actually yet to ask a question uh, both of you on your podcast. To cut to the chase, I was curious about how copyrighted items play a part in stories. For example, if I were to write a story and mention that my characters were eating at McDonald's or that one of the characters was given the nickname Harry Potter, teasingly, of course, that could put uh, the author in line of fire... could that put the author in line of fire for some sort of lawsuit? I realize that most of the authors that this podcast is directed towards may not be selling their works, and thus they'd be under the they'd be under the radar so much as this might not be an even afterthought. With that in mind, let's pretend the story being written is going to be published and sold. Finally, to extend the question to yourselves and make this drab letter even more fun, how do you often find yourselves making puns and spin-offs of actual places, characters, events, etc., and putting them in your own stories? Cheers, Yakitate. Um, if it's real common out in the public domain, um, 
brands and whatnot, you can use anything like that in your stores yeah. without being sued. Like characters, like in the Forrester books, the Cobblets out like go to Starbucks and and they talk about Harry Potter and yeah, um, yeah, it's all just common. Um, things you cannot use are uh, song lyrics, um, other copyrighted written works. You cannot include in your own written work. So um, you could include like mcdonald's corporate logo but you could not include like, um a transcript from supersize me right uh yeah i mean that's the, the sort of thing where um yeah copyright law is weird yeah but and, don't worry about it for yeah. that so what about the second part uh, <laughs> well let's see you're the one who comes up with the puntastic names for celebrities yeah uh, i would say i would say less, less than usual or less than previous yeah, less and yeah. less as time goes on yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's not really my MO a lot, I guess, so I'll just leave it at that. Time. Hey there, Webby Pod Flustery One, Fuzzy Tailed Weaver, Football Tales, Technologically Savvy Lupine, and Invisible Guest. To start, I would like to congratulate you for doing two live shows in two months. That is a feat that even the illustrious Notcast has not yet achieved. Hooray! Hooray! Hopefully you'll keep it up and one day do a live show every month for an entire year. Hopefully I'll I keep, keep it thinking, up. I keep thinking, though, this might kill KM by flustering him too much. I think it might kill Kit. Uh, now for a writing question. I'm doing a very character-based story and I'm having trouble making the character believable and fluid. Make Are you writing about the T-1000? Oh, uh, man, yours is better. <laughs> when you write a very character-centered story, do you sit down and write a quick rundown of the character's personality, background, etc., or do you just dive right into it? I would like some advice on making better characters if you have any. Uh, yes, write your characters better. Thanks, guys. You are always a great help and are very entertaining. By the way, Kyle, there might be more Canadian soda for you at Rainforest. Hirosaka Sana will provide even more Canadian wine right from the wilds of the Okanagan Desert. I believe it's Okanagan. Okanagan. If you don't remember, I was the dragon at RF that provided the Canadian Coke Zero and the White Merlot. Um, that was from Dragon Man Mike. Yes, who we that White Merlot was delicious, by being, the way. Being uh, fam- uh, a semi-famous podcaster, at least. Yeah. I remember He just well. did you fan art. Yes, he did, which was very cool. Um, how to create characters? Try to get into their head, and you know when you are writing, you know for them, don't feel the need to front load it for the reader. Let the reader discover the character, like as if they were like you know meeting a person. When you meet a person for the first time, you don't know everything about their personality. Think about what the character wants, mm-hmm. why they're in a scene, why they're doing what they're doing, um, because every character is motivated by something. And if you think about what that is and why they want it, then you have a great handle on them. Yeah. And make sure that the reader knows what they want and yep. why they want it. And that's the important thing. Or that the reader can see why, how they're acting. Yeah. Even if they don't know exactly what they Masking want. Masking motivations only works for so long. So there we go. Dear Kyle Cam and possible guest, if one is present, I have a question or two that recently just popped in my head and I wanted to get them written and sent in before I forgot. My first question is about not about writing, but about reading. I will openly admit I sometimes have a difficult time pronouncing words I'm not familiar with, whether it be a play script, a new book, or even a book I've read half a dozen times, uh, such as Vol, Harry Potter, or even Star Wars. I've always run across one of those words I have greater hassle in pronouncing, midichlorians. When I <laughs> do, I either skip the word, try to stumble Vol. over it, or <laughs> ask for my help. My questions are, has this happened to any of you? If so or not, what advice do you guys have on figuring out the correct pronunciation of a word you don't know? Thanks a bunch, and watch out for eagles. Fratus the actor fox. Uh, I would just sound it out. Um, nowadays, you can go on the web and kind of get a pronunciation for pretty much any word. Um, but, you know, regardless, just figure out how you would pronounce it to yourself, and if it turns out that you've been pronouncing it wrong for years and years, well... Join the club. That's I pronounce, I pronounce Hermione's name wrong to myself for the whole first book. Because um, it's not a name you run into in the U.S. Yeah. I'm trying to remember which... That, that happened with a couple characters of mine. Um, but I forget what they were. It's like how uh, Rowling didn't originally... I mean, not of in, mine, but, you know. Didn't Rowling originally intend the T at the end of Voldemort's name to be silent? But because everyone pronounced it like that, they just sort of went with it? Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. Isn't it? Well, I think in the early audiobooks, doesn't Jim Dale say Voldemort? Yeah. Yeah. Flight from death, sort of. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, you know, pronounce it for yourself. Look for resources on the internet. And just, you know, if you ever meet the person who wrote it, don't say those words in front of them. <laughs> or ask them how it's pronounced. Yeah. 
people ask me about that all the time. Also, for Vol, he says in the beginning of the book how it's pronounced. Right. It rhymes with Wall, in case you couldn't tell from the way we were pronouncing it. Hey, Sheathers. I'm a long-time listener, but a first-time writer. That makes me an email virgin. Anyway, I don't really have a writing-related question, but I wanted to make a comment on Kyle's All Eagles Are Bastards story from episode 75. I'm an avid fan of the Rockstar video games, Grand Theft Auto, their most notable game. In one game, there's an arcade game you can play as a minigame. You are a flying squirrel that uses acorns to shoot down enemies flying at you. It's mostly bees and bats, but at the end of each level, the boss enemy is an eagle. You have to shoot him multiple times, and if you don't shoot him fast enough, he sends a flying fish at you like a heat-seeking missile. It's true. Eagles are bastards. See, I was right. Well, that's all I really wanted to say. Hope you enjoyed my little story. I'll be sure to write in with an actual writing question next time. Love the podcast. Keep writing. From your Northwoods furry, Griffel. P.S. The I is short. You say it like Griffin. Which are like eagles, and so they're like half-bastards. They're half-bastards. So are they born half out of wedlock? <laughs> um, but also like the, that he told us how to pronounce his name. Yeah, see? So there you go. There you go, Fratus. There is hope yet. Um <laughs> And we had, yeah, so we had a couple I'm people. I'm going to turn into a swan and fuck you. <laughs> we had a couple <laughs> people writing, writing in for the first time. Um, there was another, uh, oh, Kit and I saw Rango recently. And there was a, it's not an eagle, but it's a hawk in that one. And he is a bastard. Aren't they basically the same thing? Yeah, pretty much. And then like a bunch of ornithologists and or avian furries are going to come down upon me like the fist of an angry god. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I wanted to note, I mean, not only were all those emails written by different people, which was kind of cool, but I also believe that none of the emails used the same greeting for us. Oh, they, we got sheathers a couple times. I, I find it... We got greeting like, sheathers. Interesting that that's become our name. Hello again, dear unsheathed, land and water foxes, triple K cast, um, insert salutation yeah. here, unsheathed crew, Mr. Fox and Mr. Otter. Um, K-named podcasters, purveyors of finest smut. Time. Oh, wait. Are we still doing that? No. <laughs> Sheathers, river swimmer, prairie hopper, and also technical wolf. Um, K&K, fluffy-tailed and webby-fingered podcasters, fantastic Mr. Fox and whimsical Mr. Otter, and webby pod, uh, flustery, I think that was my favorite, webby pod, flustery one, fuzzy-tailed weaver of football tales, technologically savvy lupine. And invisible, and invisible guest. <laughs> oh shit, we're in love to go. <laughs> um He went all Sue Storm on us. <laughs> oh. You're not played by Jessica Alba. Oh, I was about to say I do <laughs> I do consider myself the Jessica Alba of our social circle, so Wow. Because I can't act. It's like a I have fake boobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, the problem is I don't know which one of us would be the thing if we did the Fantastic Four. <laughs> Me, Careful. <come> on. <laughs> yeah, but you're an otter. Yeah. And you're way more likely to say flame on. I, in fact, say it sometimes. <laughs> for when I, in fact, do just that. <laughs> um, Speaking of which, we were graced uh, this past weekend with the early release of Lady Gaga's new single, and it's delightful. <laughs> Speaking of flame on. Oh god. So like the opening line of the chorus. Uh-huh. She says, "I'm just a holy fool." But the first like 10 times I listened to the song, I thought she says, "I'm just a horny fool," which still fits the song in context, and I think it's better. Okay. Yay, Mondegreens. <laughs> oh, come on. You have to know what that means. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, M- of course. M O N D E G R E E N. Look it up on the internet, Mondegreen. It means when you mishear lyrics to songs oh, and think right. about something else. Oh, I thought that was just colloquially called a kiss this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that, that's the whole thing. Excuse me while I kiss this guy. Right. That's a Mondegreen. Right. But it's like, it comes from the thing where it's like, like the Earl of something and laid him on the green. And the thing is like Lady Mondegreen oh. is how it has been misheard. Right, right. So to name the thing, they picked an obscure one that nobody's ever heard of. It's It came from the UK. Oh, uh, well, that explains it. Mm-hmm. Um, Where they have names like Hermione and God. Nigel. Yes, and Condrell. Although he is also not British. Why do all the people we know in the UK are not British? I know. <laughs> I mean, I do know actual British. Actually, most of the people I know who are <laughs> British live in the US. <laughs> Well, we know British people in the U.S., and we know like various other foreign people who live in Britain. Um, anyway, 
Um, thank you for writing in. We've cleared out a bunch of our emails and had a great time doing it, as we always do on the Lightning Rounds. Yeah, it's just, I, I feel almost spent after this. It's like, this has been transcendent. It's, they're always real high energy things. And orgiastic. Really cool. It is something astic. Um, we are uh, accepting more emails at unsheathpodcast at gmail.com. I should mention, because I mentioned earlier that somebody had written us a note on FA, that that is probably a not good way to get in touch with us because we do not check that FA account frequently. No. Um, send us an email. Yes. Unsheathpodcast at gmail.com. Um, you can contact us individual like. Uh, I do check my notes on FA where I'm username Kyle, K Y E L L. Uh, Kyle Gold on Twitter, Kyle Gold on Live Journal. I am Cam Hirasaki on all of those. I don't check my FA like super frequently. Sometimes I'll go like a couple of weeks before between checking it, especially if I haven't posted anything recently. But I at least try to check it every couple of days. But uh, at least once recently, like I missed some like time sensitive request, <laughs> and I apologize for that, especially because it was going to get me wine. <laughs> Aww. And I was like, hey, there's like this wine sale that like is ending in two days. I'm like, oh, that was sent like eight days ago. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, thank well, you anyway. Um, and if you need a timer whistle, just Google online stopwatch, and there's a bunch of utilities out there you can find. Also, <laughs> iJedi is a much better retelling of the events from the Jedi Academy trilogy because Kevin J. Anderson is a hack. I, I said time. Stop, stop <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> Um, okay. thank you and <laughs> thank you and keep writing. Hit the button, Kit. <laughs>